Well, good day. It's Glenn here from Heavy Cow Milk Company. This is the Unreasonable Farmer podcast where we talk to really unreasonable people doing unreasonable things. And today we have Julia Lom from um, the University of British Columbia. And they have a unit there that's been doing a, a whole heap of really interesting stuff around, uh, well, cow emotions and cognitive um, ability and, and all sorts of stuff. And um, the more I look into it uh, and the more I sort of uh, learn about what they're doing, it's, it's really, really interesting for us here at uh, Happy Cow. And it kind of, um, it just plays into helping us to understand, you know, what, what are cows thinking? What do cows prefer? And um, why do they prefer it? And those sorts of things. So uh, pretty lucky to have Julia here today to explain her research. Um, thanks, Julia, for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for inviting us. I'm uh, for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here. It's fantastic. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, no, no. Well, um, we'd love to hear about um, uh, what your research is. Can, can so? Can you explain how you got into this um, this field and and what you are actually doing? Yeah, for sure. So. Um, Basically, so I'm a vet first, I guess, mm -hmm. and I'm originally from Germany. I moved to Canada, Vancouver area in about in 2013. And before I came here, I worked as a vet in the dairy field um, for about four years in Germany. Mm -hmm. And then I came to um, Vancouver to join the animal welfare program because, you know, they're world renowned. So I heard about them when I was in Germany and I wanted to know more, more as well. And they mm. and so I stayed here for for a PhD and do, did some research um, on the behavior of sick cows in the week in the days and weeks after they were calving during the PhD. But while I was doing that, at the same time, I um, learned more about reward based training and animal training not through the research I was doing, but I was kind of on the side and I got really interested in that and mm -hmm. was super lucky that I had these amazing supervisors, Dan Wary and Nina von Kaiserlink, who then were on board to do some research in that area, which really allowed me to um, combine my loves really for dairy cows, but now also for animal uh, for animal training and especially reward-based training. So that's basically what I'm doing now. So I'm an uh, animal trainer. I do dog training as well. And from a research perspective, I'm really interested in how we can bring more reward-based training into the dairy world so that we can make handling animals and like some of the procedures more um, less aversive for the cows and just more positive generally. Right. So um, when you say reward behavior, that's that's kind of like how we train a dog to come and sit and things like that. You would get it to do something, then you give it a reward and it, and it learns. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Just like that. So that's what we did with the cows. And you know what? It works for that's how animals learn, generally speaking. So <laughs> us as well and mice and any animal you pick, really. So it, it works for cows, but we haven't done much research in with that in dairy cows, you know, so far. So, so right, yeah. So I suppose the idea is that instead of, de um, I suppose you could push a cow to do something and you could force her to do something, but you're you're saying, well, why not make it, make it so that she wants to do it on her own volition? Exactly. So when we think about it from, it's exactly pretty much, as you're saying, so right now we're in most systems that we're using, we're kind of using ourselves often or any other devices to make the cow go somewhere where we want her to be at that moment in time, right? Because we need her to be there for milking, for example, or because she's moving pens if you're working in a barn or if you have pastures, you move her to, from pasture to pasture, for example. So there's a lot of, we need, we're using a lot of what is often called pressure and release system. So we are using our presence, which is often a little bit scary or aversive to cows to get them move away from us and to the point where, or to the place where we want them to move. And exactly as you said, why don't we teach cows to go to these places because it's worth it for them to go there. And mm. um, that usually works really well. 
with other animals. So it doesn't work with cows, you know. Right. So you said you were a, a vet in Germany and mm -hmm. you're also practicing in, in, in Canada. Well, your research in Canada. How is the Canadian dairy industry different to the German industry? You know what? I, I find it is and it's not. So I've seen <laughs> dairy industries. I went to South Africa. I've went to I've been in Germany all over the place. I here now I've seen mm -hmm. farms in the US and it in the end it's so similar in terms of you know cows have to go to milking most of the systems i've seen are barn based systems so mm -hmm. different to new zealand i would think right like new zealand mm -hmm. most is mostly pasture based i guess yeah i've yeah. i've hardly ever seen a barn okay <laughs> and mm. okay but so most of the like all of that is very similar um mm. i mean they're the two big differences I find are more from a farmer perspective, so dairy industry perspective almost. So ah, I yeah. find that the Canadian dairy farmers are well are really organized in terms of like some of the funding we get from the for the animal welfare program is for example from the Canadian dairy farmers, which is amazing. And I have not heard of anything like that in Germany at all and ah I see. so the industry is more organized in canada to i suppose from a funding bespoke uh, perspective for research exactly so at least from from what i know from germany right like i mean obviously like i might my knowledge there might be a little bit limited but i haven't seen anything like this that the dairy industry as a whole is so interested in this animal welfare re research i think is fantastic and then the other, definitely the big difference, of course, is that Canada has a quota system, meaning that farmers are only allowed to produce milk if they buy a certain amount of quota, meaning they pay for how much milk mm. they're allowed to produce. But that, on the other hand, allows them to have pretty stable milk prices so they have a good solid income that they can rely on. And we had that in Germany, but it was, I think, a ban. Like, I think they stopped having that in 2014 or something after I left Germany. Mm. And so there's much more fluctuation. And I think farmers have generally a much harder time um, economically mm. than than here in Canada. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I wouldn't expect you to say that the, the Canadians were more organized than Germans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But, well, um, <laughs> surprises, right? <laughs> that's interesting because we um, at Happy Cow, we're sort of eyeing up the German dairy industry. We sort of think that's a, a big market for us simply because, okay. like you said, the, the, the German dairy farmers are really struggling financially. And um, and we see that as a, as a huge market that, um, you know, we can give them the tools to process their milk and, uh, and sell direct to the, um, the, their local customers. That is actually so fantastic. I love that because I think, you know, I, for me, like going, you know, thinking back, I haven't worked as a vet here in Canada, but of course I had so many good relationships with farmers in Germany and, you know, most farmers I know love their cows and work so hard and it's just devastating to see how that doesn't get rewarded and like just yeah. how it's not economic right so and then what happens is the animals suffer too because if you're i think it's um like farmers struggle to to make make ends meet so often what they do they find a second job which how horrible like you know like how unfair is that they work already full time on their farm it's such a stressful job and like requires so much of your time and effort and but they will find a second job. So that means they spend less time on their farm. That means they spend less time taking care of their animals, right? So I think like, I love the idea of giving them better tools to actually make money through what they're doing and what they love doing. So that's fantastic to hear. And I'm glad to hear you say that because that's sort of what our research has shown that, um, you know, the farmers, they keep going, but they take off farm income or they have unpaid um family to help them keep going and uh, and I think when customers if they've given a choice they'd much rather buy from their local farmer that they kind of know and they can trust and see that they're doing the right thing yeah especially you know I think if they know 
that the animals are treated well, I think that has become more and more of interest, right? Mm. And also I think that customers are, if it's easy for them, I mean, it's always complex, right? I think often they say they are willing to pay more, but if they don't get access easily to the better product, they will just go for, for the cheaper product. Mm, mm. if it's right in front of them you know so i think giving them easy access like giving consumers easy access through access to through the system that you're building where mm. you know like i think your system will work well for for the local farmers but also for the people because they from what i understand it will make it easier for local farmers to bring mm. the milk to where the people are already where the people already are so it's not going to be a huge effort for them to get the milk that mm. they actually want right yeah that's right anyway we're um we're talking about me um can you can you go you've got some videos you've got some slides can you can you show us what you've been doing and, and what you mean by um you know the reward based system yeah for sure i'll show you a little bit about the research i'm do i've been doing um mm -hmm. let's see if the share slide sharing oh, works yep <laughs> um share screen Let's see. Ah, uh, yep. Here we go. Yes, it works. Oh my God, that's fantastic. Perfect. Brilliant. So there we go. Nice. So, and if ever anything changes in regards, because I don't see you, just let me know. Um, yep. If you need that's to fine. interrupt me or anything. Um, so first of all, I guess before I get started, any of this re like any of these research projects are group efforts. This would never be me alone. So I did this with the animal welfare program together. And as I already mentioned, the, we get support from the dairy industry for this research. So I do want to say a big thank you to them and to my co-authors who were Dan Wary, Nina von Kaiserlink, and Amandine from France. And of course, to everybody at the farm, at our research farm who was involved and animal training friends who offered a lot of support through the study. And of course the heifers who were part of the study, animals always get a thank you as well. <laughs> so basically what we did to just very brief, briefly say that, we trained eight dairy heifers. And I don't know if everybody who's listening knows what heifers are. So um, they're basically one year old female dairy cows who aren't in milk yet so they are not pregnant yet and they aren't being milked yet and we trained them with this reward based system and i'll show you videos of that um, to voluntarily participate for an injection or for a fake injection so we just pretended to inject them during the training let, let me give you so the background for that was that as you know, Glenn, we do a lot of stuff to, to cows, like a lot of procedures um, that the cows don't necessarily find very pleasant just because we need to keep them healthy and for management. So, for example, we need to vaccinate them throughout their lives and we need to do hoof trimming, for example, to keep their claws healthy and to keep them lameness free. So for all of these procedures, every time we have to do that, that means we have to restrain them. That means they can't walk away. They are in really close contact with humans and most cows, when given a choice, they don't actually prefer that. You know, there might be individual cows who actually like to get scratched, but that's definitely not true for every cow. Mm -hmm. And then of course, all the procedures that we're doing are some somewhat unpleasant for them, some more than others, but even injection might be not super painful, but there's some pain involved, right? So over time or overall, it's just not very pleasant for the cows. Mm. And so with that in mind, our question was a little bit, we know from zoo animals especially, but also from dogs and cats that we can use reward-based training to teach them to participate in these procedures so we're not using don't have to use restraint we don't have to use and they're more um they're better with the close human contact so that the the overall procedure then is just much more pleasant for the animal and if it works i wanted to show you because i think it was kind of the guiding star and kind of when i saw that and i was like oh yeah this is what i, I wonder if we can do that with cows I think the um, mm. 
was like this zebra video and it's a voluntary blood draw so if anybody is worried about there is a syringe and a needle and a little bit of blood so if anybody's sensitive <laughs> should probably just no watch i don't think it's too bad and what you'll see is that the zebra can basically she'll it's like a minute video but um is it playing for you yep that's good perfect so what you can see is that the zebra could actually walk away right there's no restraint they taught the mm -hmm. zebra to come to the fence and stand there and the zebra is being rewarded with food to stand there and wait patiently and then what you'll see next is that the zebra has learned that to also do that when somebody is actually taking a blood sample so i'll just let you watch Well, I'm, I'm impressed you got the vein. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's amazing. It's just it's just come there. It's Because basically that wouldn't hurt it as much, but it's not pleasant. If you ask the zebra, it would rather not have an injection like that. Exactly. And when you think about it, I mean, it's a wild animal and it certainly would never choose to stand so close to humans either, right? Mm, um, mm. So I think it's part both of that. Um, but absolutely, like, I think there's some, just to protect your body, if you don't understand what the injection or blood draw is for, you would always pull away for sure from mm. something that, like a needle, right, mm -hmm. to prevent harm to your body. So, so anyways, that was kind yeah. of our inspiration, I guess. Mm -hmm. And now let me see if the screen <laughs> moves ahead. Is it moving for you? Um, Probably not. Let me do oh, it. I can see your mouse oh, moving. Here. Oh, good. Can you see my next yep. slide? Yep. Perfect. Brilliant. That was awesome. So basically, based on that, our goals for the study were, can we do the same with cows, basically? Right? We wanted to know, can we do that with cows? But we didn't train them all the way for an injection for the research question we just stopped just short of it so basically we trained them as you see in the picture so we kind of as you can imagine it's kind of the stationing behavior so she's she's learned to put her head through this headlock and to stand close to the wall right next to her mm -hmm. um, which is similar to the zebra video mm -hmm. and then we taught her to stand there up to that we could actually do a pretend injection with a cut of needle so we would mm -hmm. poke her but actually not go through the skin mm. and that's what what we trained eight heifers to do um and once they would were able to do that we then tested we actually gave them an actual injection under the skin just one milliliter of saline solution um, and wanted to know what their behavioral response would be to that actual injection after all that training and compared to animals who had never been trained and were actually restrained during the procedure. So for just to make sure this heifer, like we never closed the headlocks for these heifers. They were never, they could always leave if they wanted to leave. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any questions so far? No, that's good. So what you're saying is um, you also tested one uh, heifers where you did restrain them, where you probably closed the headlock yeah we did yeah. exactly and yeah. some of the heifers we had brought up during all that time to get them familiar with the environment mm -hmm. and some of the heifers had no experience whatsoever we they were like in the same pen the house together so they knew us from going into and out of the pen but they had never to, been to this training area and they had never um been really close to us either okay exactly so um So, um, so it's going to be just a few example videos for from this training process and what this looked like. So one of the things that we actually didn't specifically train, but that happened over time, um, was that the heifers that we trained, they loved, loved, loved to come for their training session. And that was true before the injection. And that was, that was still the same after the injection. So um, this is what that looked like. So I'm going to pick up that heifer from her pen.
and they could basically, like you can see the second heifer lining up too. So our biggest problem was actually that not more than one heifer came out of the out of the pen and away from the group and everybody has a little bit experience with cows. Um, mm. Walking away from their social group is actually not something that cows voluntarily do very often. So, mm. right, like for them being here and being part of that training session was really highly rewarding. And of course they would get grain during the training procedure, but they never actually got grain for just coming here. So oh, only, only through the, only during the procedure. Exactly. Only during the training that was leading up to the procedure. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that was the first thing. So actually during the training, what we had to teach them first to actually come to this area and was kind of the first step and evolved for them to this point where they came just happily running, um, couldn't wait for, for their turn. And now it's playing again and I just don't know. Um, so, and then the next step was to teach them to come into the headlock voluntarily. And that was super super easy like they after a few sessions they were just so good at it and you can see how quick she is get she can't wait to put her head in there so i could basically i couldn't even get out of the way quick enough after mm. i opened the headlock for most of the heifers right i show you one heifer but honestly this looked the same for all of the three, eight heifers yeah no i could um yeah, I completely understand that. When uh, when they learn that they will get fed at a certain time, they'll uh, they'll come running. And you know, in New Zealand, whenever we go to uh, wind up an electric fence, you know, they just hear the sound of the electric fence yeah. being wound up, and they all come running. So I love yeah. that. Actually, I gonna take a note. I gonna take a note of that because I think, you know, one of the things is that we do a lot of these things on farms already. Hmm without paying too much attention to it, but we could use these things like mm. in a better way, you know, in a better way. Mm. Well, you know what, what I mean? um, my father would do was when we had the calves on the farm, every time we moved the calves to a new paddock, he would just call them. So he would just say, come on, come on, come on. And, and he just did that every day for, every time he moved them from calves right up to cows. And then, you get to the stage where you just call, use that exact same call, and all the cows know exactly what it means. It means they're getting fed. Exactly. And, um, yeah. Yeah. Perfect. See, there you go. Like, that's exactly, that's reward-based training. That's how, and, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. this is why I think, I don't know, this is kind of why I'm so excited about it, because I think we're actually, many farmers do these things in some way on their farm already. And mm. it shows that it works, right? So I think one, and we can talk more about it later maybe, but I think one stretch would be is how can we just use it a little bit more systematically in the mm. areas where it would help us to handle and manage cattle better, right? We're already yeah. doing it. We'll just have to think about how to implement it in a different way or in a mm. different situation maybe pretty much. But yeah, I love yeah. those examples. Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Carry on. Oh, no, I love that. I really enjoy having the conversation about it instead of just me talking. So this is perfect. Um, so basically, after they had learned to go into the headlock, the next big milestone was then to teach them that to be okay with the second person standing next to them. And this is Armandine who did, who was amazing and helped me during the project and did the injections late, lastly. But um, so basically they had to learn for the person to stand there, be okay with that and not move away. But then also for a person to touch them. And we did that first by just touching them with her, our hands. And then over time we touched them with, let's say a pen poking against them and, or we used a paper clip, you know, we bent that open and poke them with that to pretend this injection um, happening, right? So we kind of um, made it a little bit harder and harder for them over time to be okay with standing there and not moving away. So in the mm -hmm. video, what you're gonna see is 
a heifer at the very beginning of this training process and you'll see that she can like Omandine is barely touching her and it's too much for her. And then the second heifer that you'll see is a heifer that was that is fully trained. So you'll see Omandine, there was a sub, um, injection under the skin and to do that you kind of have to pull away the skin with one hand and then you're using the syringe or the needle to get in between the skin or to get under the skin. So you'll see Amandine exactly doing that. So she's going to pull away some of that heifer skin and then she'll poke the heifer with this cutoff needle. So it's not going through the skin at this point, actually. Yeah. So if she yeah. carried so on she says, her, yeah, exactly. She would have been gone. And you can see how there's no, it's it's ever so slightly, right? And it's actually if the heifers, if animals have a choice, they will often say no, thank you. And she, I love how she's curious about it, though. And she's like, hey, excuse me, what yeah. were you just doing? Yeah. Um, so she had the, um, the, she had the option to back out and walk away, which she did. Exactly. Um, but then, oh, actually, I'll come back to you. Carry on. Yeah, and so this is the second heifer, and she's at this point fully trained. So this is many training sessions later. So that's actually inserting the needle. This was not inserting the needle. So this was, ah. it looks like a needle. Like we had a syringe and we had like a cutoff needle. So we poked her really oh, hard, right. but we didn't yep. actually go through the skin. Exactly. Okay. And, and she was, just stayed there. And she just stayed there and you can see the headlock was open. She, she could have done exactly the same and leaving, but she decided it was okay. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, like having the control to move away when you want to really builds a lot of trust too, right? Like we, mm -hmm. like when we think about going to the dentist, it's okay because we know what's going to happen. So we can mm. predict what's going to happen and we have the control to let the dentist know to please take a break or it's too painful. Or, you know, like we know that they are going to stop when you ask them to stop. Yeah. And that gives you so, you know, that changes how you perceive the entire situation compared with, imagine like they would chain you down on the dentist chair. You'd probably never go back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, that's um, that was what I was going to ask. Is there a cycle? Is it beneficial to the animal knowing that she has control to back away if she wants to? You know, does that change the circumstance for her? I do think so, and I think there's mm. research mounting that it really does. So, how what your expectations are of a procedure or of a situation really influence how you mm. how you um what you actually make of the situation or procedure. So when we talk about pain, for example, right? Pain is actually some, what, an emotional experience. So of course there is like, if you get poked in your arm, of course there is like the neurological response through your nerves to your brain, like all that information is being brought into your brain. Mm -hmm. But actually your experience, your emotional experience is what your brain makes out of that and what your brain makes out of that is informed on your learning history of what happened to you before. So basically your brain expects a certain thing to happen based on your, ex on your experiences. And mm. that will change how you perceive how aversive or how bad this poke is for you, how, how you mm. actually perceive that. It doesn't only have to do with the poke in itself but it has mm -hmm. to do what what you had learned before would happen in this kind of situation, right? Yep. Does that make sense? Yep, no, I understand. Okay. And um, I, you, you've done some a lot of research around that as well, which we could go into afterwards, but... Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. exactly. So definitely some of my colleagues have at the Animal Welfare Program and Dan Wary has, so we can definitely chat about that too. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So let me show you... Um, of course, I want to show you the actual injections. So based mm -hmm. on what you just saw in the video, 
um, that was kind of our endpoint for the training procedure. That's what we wanted to get to. And then once the animals were trained to that point, we said, okay, now that if we give them, if we actually poke them with a needle, just briefly, so it was really just one milliliter of saline solution, how will they then react to that um, injection? So here I just brought two videos of two trained cows or two trained heifers. And of course, there are eight individuals, so they did have a range of um, behaviors they showed in, to that injection. But so I thought I'll bring you the heifer that reacted the very least and then the heifer that reacted the most. And you'll see that this is actually wasn't too bad either. So let me play this for you. All right, so she's a, she's given the injection now. Exactly, she's giving the injection now, and you can see, like she's kicking once, but basically, that could have been a fly sitting on her back, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not noticing anything. Exactly, <laughs> and she says, "Well, no, thank you." Same response, excuse me, and that, but in the end, she comes right back in, right? So it was. Oh, yeah. She had a sniff and then went back. Exactly. So it wasn't that, you know, she ran away in a panic. She just oh, said so that no. was Okay, so she's administered the injection and she pulled back exactly. and then came back in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think the, the, if I could, yeah, the, the argument that a, a farmer would make if they're trying to inject, let's say, 500 cows is... They just want to get the job done. And they would say, we'll close the headlock, give it a jab, and then let her go. And rather than worry about having to train cows and all those sorts of things, and then worry about cows pulling back and, and so on. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know what? Of course, obviously, I understand that. I'm a vet. I've done this a million times. And <laughs> I've had... 14 and 16 hour days trying to get the job done. And I totally agree, of course, right? So I totally get that. And I honestly, of course, I don't expect a farmer to stand in the barn and train cows the way we did either. But no, I but do having, think- Having said that, sorry to interrupt you. Um, having said that, like the example with my father, you start with the calves and you just run through a routine and it just becomes what happens every time you- go through the yards or whatever it's it's virtually a training so i think absolutely you can. yeah i agree mm -hmm. like every interaction we have like animals learn 24 7 if you want to or not right so every interaction is a learning experience for the animal and mm -hmm. um if you if you if you pay attention to that or not it's gonna happen that way for sure so i totally agree with you and then the other thing and um that i we can talk about more is we have technology all around us. So do we actually have to do this with people involved as much as we did? Or can we mm. not use the technology that we already have in our cows? That's, you know, like, let's think about reusing virtual fencing. So we have cows with GPS and um, like a transponder on their collar that gives them a tactile stimulation. We could change mm. that tactile stimulation to a more pleasant one, like maybe just vibration, and use the exact same system and then find a way mm. to, to make this a reward-based training system, right? Like mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. the technology. So I think like that could be a way forward from, from what I'm thinking, but I'd love to discuss this more. <laughs> yeah, well, um, New Zealand's got a company called Halter that just raised uh, $32 million um, with the, the defenseless system. and. Uh, Yes, it's definitely um, an exciting time, and they, they seem to be having good results on farms. Yeah, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. to just finish this um, off with here, and we can come mm, back to this, carry on. Um, is that, so I guess, so basically we gave the injection, and as I mentioned before, like the cows, like the trained cows came running, after the injection um as before so they you know like even the ones that had backed out 
of the while we were giving the injection by the way we five of the eight heifers that we had trained were standing perfectly still and three of the heifers left the headlock um mm. after yeah. the or during the injection but basically so what we were interested in too was how will that change how interested they are in our playing session or training sessions basically and really it didn't have any effect on their willingness to come to the training area or in on their willingness to come into the headlock so they were just fine doing all of yeah. this even after this unpleasant experience or mm -hmm. after this injection experience but i do think you know I, as i said earlier we did have two control groups i didn't bring much video of them um but i did bring i just wanted to show you this because i think it illustrates so nicely how easy once they were trained, it was to move them instead of doing it the normal way of pushing them, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. this is two days after the injection and the first heifer you already saw it. So this is a one that was trained. And then the second heifer is an untrained one that we also wanted to get into the headlock. So here's that video. So no problem at all. And this looks much different. Oh, yeah. So she doesn't want to put her head in. This is the first she time she's been not, That's two days after the injection. Ah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So she says, no, thank you. I That was not a good experience in there at all. And we had several mm -hmm. animals that we could not um, bring back. And not, now, of course, we do have tools, right, we can use if we have to move animals who really don't want to go. And for this research, it didn't make any sense to go down that way. But basically, if we do that, the only option that we have is to use more aversive things to make the cow move to where we want her to move, right? That's almost our only option, from my perspective. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, just to confirm, this is the untrained heifer? Yeah, that's an untrained yeah. heifer, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, in the end, like this is how we usually move cows. And you could probably argue, well, Amandine is standing there in a perfect system. We wouldn't have a person standing right next in front of the heifer, right? That definitely doesn't help. We had to have her there for the headlock. Um, and because we did that with the trained heifers. But generally speaking, like I was risk, I could have gotten kicked, right? Like I was right next to the heifer. If she wanted to, was in a panic, she could have easily pushed me out of the way too. So I find during training, I was always on the other side of the gate. So it was actually much safer for me as well because I was just not physically present with the, he yeah. with the heifers. Yeah, so in a typical sort of way of, working with animals in a in a yard situation like this, the cow doesn't really, it's not natural for her to put her head into a slot like that, into exactly. a, a headlock. And it's not natural for her to actually want to, uh, if you're standing in front of her, she won't come towards you. So exactly. when, in the trained um, videos, it was actually coming towards you because you had the reward. And exactly. that goes against, uh, I suppose, the, the rules of, uh, of handling stock, I suppose, the traditional way. So in, in this uh, this picture you've got here, you, what you would want to do is it, essentially the headlock is open. She, the cow would look at it thinking, oh dear, I don't really want to go through this. And then she'll try and force her way through it because she can see she's got no other option. And the person on the side would lock the head bail quickly and then she's uh, trapped, I suppose. Yeah. And then you would do, do whatever procedure you want to do, and then you would let her go, in which case you'd probably jump through, run or kick or whatever, and thank, thank goodness I'm out of there. Yeah, um, exactly. And, you yeah. know, actually, I love that you're bringing that up because we did give, so we did give the heifers the options to hang, the option to hang out for three more minutes after we opened everything up. And the heifers that were trained, they didn't want to leave. They were hoping yeah. for more and they just loved actually i don't even know if they were hoping for more but they were just investigating really relaxed everything you know they wanted to sniff everything while the heifers that were like one of the groups that had never been there those heifers and only you know had this experience of injection there they couldn't go back to their pen fast enough right they were out of there right away yeah. mm. definitely 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think there's, there's probably a couple of things going there. It's one, it's um, the positive experience of food uh, and meal is a high motivation for animals, even if they're well fed. Um, yeah, and until then, we're those heifers. Yeah, and then I suppose not having a negative experience, or even though an injection is a mildly negative experience, the the feed or the the feed overrides that, and then often I suppose the within her her attitude towards that space is that I'm free to come and go if I need to, um, so I don't need to run away. Yeah, totally. I think yeah. you summed it up very nicely. But yeah, and I think you know for for the animals that were restrained and that hadn't been trained like on the same at the same time like the injection how bad was really the injection and how bad was their experience of not being able to go away when they wanted to of not getting yeah. away from a hand reaching so what you what we saw is that they you know when they reacted to the injection they actually rea- reacted already before the injection when Ormandine was grabbing just the skin to be ready for the injection, right? Like just the person coming closer, the arm moving closer and being touched was really um, aversive to the animals and they tried to avoid that without even mm. the injection. So I think, you know, the entire picture for the hef- from the cow's perspective or heifer's perspective of being trapped and not yeah. having this control and not knowing what is gonna come um, mm-hmm. can be really difficult. And Mm -hmm. also probably previous experiences as a a calf of how it was handled. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's um, hard to say. And I think, you know, like I do, we do know that how we rear them, right, is um, influences their behavior and their cognitive abilities. So if they're single housed or group housed, um, all of these things. I mean, our heifers have been treated in the same way in Mm -hmm. this regard, because we're all on the same farm, right? They're all on the same farm. They all went through the same processes before before that. Um, So there shouldn't be a difference there, but generally speaking, of course, all of these things do make a difference to some extent. Are they grouped housed as calves or were they individually housed? They were group group housed, group housed. So for on our, so our research farm, and I think that's, probably also worth mentioning is is run as a commercial dairy farm so all the animals it's it's a research farm because we do research there but it's really a commercial dairy farm so there's no difference in Mm -hmm. how the animals are treated through their life from you know from a management perspective so what we do is we have them in a single pen for the first seven days of their lives and then they're group housed in a group of eight to ten calves at a time Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, interesting. Mm. And uh, yeah, well, I, I think the when I first came across uh, the uh, your university and their work was basically that um, research around group housing and individual housing of cows and the cognitive ability of them. Um, that was fascinating to me. Absolutely, and you know, now that I'm like, I'll be, I'll, I'm happy to talk a little bit about it, and but I will mm. add also that. I'm I'm even more fascinated and you know curious about what we could do differently. Um, Coming now, being more in the dog training world, where there's so Mm. much focus on socializing dogs when they're young puppies, and getting them used to the things that we need to do with them and that they need to do when they're older dogs, and Mm. we put so much emphasis emphasis on that and then when we compare that to single housing calves for the first three months of their lives right like what a difference and it doesn't really surprise you that cows might have trouble to navigate systems that we built for them because they've just have zero experience Mm. in when it's probably really important and yes like i mean as you mentioned we know that um group housing calves either just with the buddy, so two calves together, or in a group, or with their mom, um, can really influence how good they are at solving cognitive tasks. Um, mm. So it really influences their brain development, right? So, um, which is really interesting. So, am I correct in um, 
when I am I correct when I remember that I think you're group housing or you're keeping your cows with your cows? Um, well, we we keep our cows with their with their mothers, but um, the common practice in New Zealand would be to do group housing. Mm -hmm. um, so calves are, um, are basically reared in a group uh, from day one, um, and then. But what I wasn't aware of is in the, in the US, in particular, that um, calves would be separated and they'd live in a little cage by themselves, basically. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. And then the research that you guys, your, you guys did to sh to show. Um, well, if I remember correctly, you ran through a series of tests. They learnt. They learnt that uh, when the screen is red, you can get a treat. If it's white, you don't get a treat. And that was all groups of cows, individually housed and group housed calves, could basically run the test. But then after a while, you swapped it around. So in which case, the, the, white, the white screen meant you got a treat and the red screen meant you didn't. And the group housed cows were able to work it out after a couple of days that the rules have changed. But those single housed calves weren't able to, didn't have the cognitive ability to work that out. Is that correct? Yeah, totally. You summed it up very nicely. Absolutely correct. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and I agree, like, honestly, coming from Germany, this the U.S. system was also foreign to me. So I didn't know about that at all. Like mm -hmm. in Germany, what I had mostly seen was that cats were a single house for two weeks and then they would be moved to group. That was mm -hmm. probably the most common. And then okay. it's even not allowed to keep calves by themselves for longer than six weeks or so, I think. Mm -hmm. So yes, mm -hmm. so it's a different system, but you know, it's also really great that we see how farmers are in this area here, for example, sorry, there are dogs barking. I hope you don't That's hear fine. that too loudly. <laughs> um, um that farmers are picking up on the socially on the social housing and are starting that and trying to figure figure out how they can do it and i think that's just fantastic yeah well it's just the way it's always sort of been done in new zealand i mean you'd never yeah. house a cow but calf by itself it's like it doesn't make sense but um I, I suppose what we're trying to do is go the next step further is um leave calves with their mothers for those first eight weeks um um, but, but anyway, that's a story for another day. Yeah, but you know what I do think, and again, like when we think, I actually think, find it fascinating and let me just, I'll just pull up the next slide because I kind of thought there are some discussion points we could talk about, but just based mm -hmm. on that, like I think going the next step for me, I love that next step, of course, like I love it and I think that's the way it should be and then coming from the dog training world i almost want to think about so you know when i do when we work with puppies we get them used to being groomed and mm -hmm. we get them used to um wear all the equipment that they will have to wear because it's so much easier when they're young and they're still in their sensitive period that means they're less fearful of new things that means um they are just way easier to learn that to associate, have good associations with all the things that we need them mm. to face later on in life right so i wonder if there is anything i don't i'm not aware of any research that's really looking into that but i do think that would be another thing we could potentially add on in the future to or at least look into how if we could help younger animal dairy animals to learn about the parlor and like milking mm. systems and maybe going through a shoot and associate mm. that with positive experiences yeah because it's interesting that the first time a cow might enter a milking parlor is when she's just calved and it's her first milking exactly so basically at the worst time of her life possibly yeah right? yeah. yeah the most stressful time she's probably had in her two years of life has just happened um, exactly she's probably a little bit maternalistic wondering what's going on her calf is gone mm -hmm. and she's put onto a, a rotary platform or a, some form of milking parlor and exactly. uh, then someone's trying to milk her <laughs> yeah exactly so yeah. there and there are so many exactly right there's this close human contact being touched and be having the milking system attached um going into the mm. space 
so many things that are potentially aversive for her. So can I ask you out of curiosity, um, I hope that's okay, mm -hmm. but I was just wondering how do you separate your calves for milking from the cows or are the calves walking with the cows or what does that look like? Yeah, well, when I was doing it, I had a portable milking parlor. So our milking mm -hmm. parlor moved to the paddock. Um, so that made that relatively easy. And again, the, co the cows knew that when you walked through the cow shed or the, the milking parlor, that's when you walked into new grass. So we kind of made it the only way you get grass is when you walk through the parlor. Yeah. And um, so what a cow would do was she would carve um, and the, the milking parlor was right there. So she would um, walk through the parlor. Her calf would just sort of sit around in the paddock. She mm -hmm. would come out the other side and um, start grazing and meet up with her calf again. Hmm. So, but that system isn't common. So I think talking to farmers in New Zealand who are looking into cow and calf contact and they would have a system where the calf would walk with the mother and it's got the choice to get drafted out prior to the milking parlour or mm -hmm. it would stay um, it would stay in the laneway or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's, you know, I'm asking, I guess, because I think it's interesting from like having my trainer head on, like if there mm -hmm. is anything, because that's basically behaviors that they have to learn. And I, I just always think that that probably is one of the barriers for some farmers um, mm -hmm. to solve about this cow-calf cow contact, or is that not true? Yeah. Oh, no, it is. It's the infrastructure is not set up to, to run cows and calves together. Um, you know, if you have a, a holding yard with mm -hmm. all your cows in it waiting to be milked, if you've got, uh, you know, a couple of calves that enter into that holding yard, they'll get squashed and exactly, basically yeah. tra trampled. So, uh, yeah, that's it's definitely a, um, a, a drawback. Um, but it was interesting. I felt like, you know, how we train calves. I felt that um, our calves would be quite... Um, uh frisky or um just wouldn't have had that human contact because when when you uh, remove a calf from its mother it gets handled by people every time it's fed mm -hmm. where we virtually didn't handle our calves at all until unless uh, we would go through uh, the set of yards every week and um and that's what we did find actually is that those calves that we left alone completely they weren't used to being handled at all and they could be a little bit wild. So we then started having to, we made a point of just bringing cows and calves and just running them through yards, handling the calves, touching them, just really not really doing anything, but just making sure that they were used to being handled a bit more. And I think in our third year, we were getting a bit better results with, with our calves. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Mm. So see like another place where, um, this conditioning happens automatically on most farms, especially those who do separate cow separate calves from their cows, um, mm. is when you bring milk, right? So mm. they learn to associate, calves learn to associate milk delivery with the human. So basically the human is the one who's gonna predict that there's milk gonna be there. So we mm. have like this Pavlovian conditioning if that tells you something. So basically the classical conditioning where he rings the bell and then delivers food to the dog and the dogs learn to, mm -hmm. or they start salivating because they expect that there's food to come, mm -hmm. right? And that's what we do with calves all the time if if we do this feed delivery. Mm. So, yeah. Um, and I just, you, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I'm interrupting again. Oh, that's fine. Um, but I just think, you know, like again there, I wonder if we can use this a little bit more strategically by maybe touching the calves as we bring the milk or, you know, like not only getting them used to the human present, but also to touch or things that we frequently do without much mm. more work for the farmer, really. But yeah. might have yeah. still quite an effect on the calf's behavior. Yeah, I just, it's just so important. I'm just trying to think. Because our first lot of calves, they 
the bull calves were the ones that were the problem the female calves are fine we didn't really have a problem with those but i just had a couple of bulls that just couldn't be handled and by the time they were oh maybe three months age they were um you know quite uh, quite skittery and just hadn't had enough um human contact and um so part of the cow and calf system to be effective long term you really do need to make a point to manually have that human interaction and i suppose it's just another form of training mm. it is yeah so i think you know like maybe not now but like i do think that that's a discussion i would love to go further in because i do think that there will, would be ways to mm. to make and that happen as you're milking or whatever right like we could probably train calves i'd have no idea how exactly but you know how train calves to go to a certain location on cue or when you tell them to or on a certain signal and get their special food there or whatever and then there's people there so they learn to, mm. that they have this interaction with the people but not only having this interaction but having a positive interaction right like the positive association is what is so important mm. yeah and i think you know that point you made about handling calves and uh, or young animals and training them at that point is really important and often we we sort of don't think of it like that um yeah and i and i suppose adding that into a farming system like you said before to actually systemize this so that it does it's just not random it actually is part of the farming system and it may not benefit you now but it benefits two years down the track when you're actually uh, milking a cow or something like that yeah exactly i hope the dog barking mm. isn't so bad <laughs> no, no um, that's fine. <laughs> okay and they should stop any second um, um no but i totally agree right mm. and no how many dogs have you got three. and and my partner <laughs> just came home so they're happy and but they should be under control <laughs> anytime <laughs> maybe no, not it's fine don't worry don't worry okay about it. we can't hear it okay um anyway so I do agree. So there's a little bit of research. I I know at least one study who looked where they looked into handling young calves and then for shorter period of time, but then they stopped and then they looked at the animals like a year later or so and looked if that had any difference or if that made mm. a difference and it didn't. So I think, mm. you know, without knowing the details right, right we would have to look into what did they actually do did they just touch the animals or were they just present or did they actually feed them or you know what was going on there but i mm. think the takeaway may be that we do have to concentrate on the early in on this early phase but we can't forget the teenage phase in between entirely either so you know right mm. like most on most farms and i don't know if that's true for your farms or how that would be in new zealand but at least here from what i know is that we do a lot with calves because we feed them and we move them we vaccinate them so there's lots of human contact generally speaking but then they are like half a year old and you move them into this heifer area and then you come back to them and they're old enough to get bred but they actually have the pretty long period of time where they don't see many humans and don't have mm. that interaction. And that's when they kind of turn wild, a little bit wilder often. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do think we'd probably have to consider that, but starting with the young calves and thinking about how to strategically introduce them to moving mm. into a shoot and to the things that we know they will have to be able to do later. Um, yeah. I thought, I think would be super interesting. Yeah, it's making me think. <laughs> good <laughs> <laughs> yeah no that's that's really good anyway um have you got any other points you would like to bring up anything oh. no there's tons of stuff i could talk about i love talking about this topic but we would be here well, for like two more hours what i, I could well, show I'm, you sorry yeah no i could listen for i could talk for two hours too but uh, we do well, try we and keep it to an hour but we can carry on but carry on what well, were you going to well, we, I, I, I had brought you two more videos because oh, I awesome. thought that would be interesting, but we can always yep. come back, right, and talk about other things that are kind of related to this topic. But so what I 
so before we taught the heifers um, to go into this headlock, we actually had another group of heifers to test out some of the things that we wanted to do because obviously this was kind of a newer strategy mm -hmm. and we had we made some mistakes along the way too and had to learn a few things. So in the mm -hmm. beginning, what we thought is we would use a squeeze chute and train them to walk into there and do basically everything else the same, but just use that squeeze chute, which for various reasons didn't work. But we did train them to walk in there. So on the topic of moving animals into two spaces that we or places we need them to be, mm -hmm. um, I show you how we did that because I think that's pretty applicable on farms from my mm -hmm. perspective. So what we taught them is to bump bump their nose onto this red target here. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So, and then we kind of move them along into the shoot this way. So let's see this video. So this first video is the heifer being trained. So it's going to be like a minute long video, but you'll yep, see right. her. So what we taught her is to basically follow this red target. And then we fed her for touching it. And the way we were uh. feeding them was with grain so she we had like this bucket for grain and then we moved her a few steps further and she kind of followed it and came in and then this is how we moved her all the way up and you can see you know like from an experienced eye such a bad setup because she had to walk through the scale first and over yeah, here out of the like, scale not very yeah, it doesn't look inviting to a cow no, it really doesn't look inviting to a cow. And the more fearful animals did not do this very well. It's like for them, it took a while to get over this, over this place here because they didn't want to do the step down and then step back up again. Yeah. But anyway, so this is like one way, right? We never had to push her. And she just learned to follow this. And she was really good at targeting it. Yeah, and she so she hits it with her nose, and then you get a give her a feed. Exactly, and then we give her feed, and then you know, just a few sessions later, this is this is what this looked like, and we could basically not open it up for her fast enough, and she was ready to. Yeah. Yep, yeah, she's running. So I, yeah, she's running in and, you know, for this, obviously, I do have to say we never actually did anything to her there. We never yeah. closed it and we never did anything. And we don't know how much that would affect everything. But I just think it's so nice to mm -hmm. see that there are different ways. And then from there, we can test out how to best use it. Yeah, well, it just I don't think you need to do anything to it. Just looking at that setup is just opposite of what it, it promotes good flow what you call yeah. of a cow a cow does not want to walk into that it's it's there's it's narrow it's dark there's things above her there's things movements to the side all those things would say that a cow wouldn't move into that area exactly and, uh, basically yeah, you've trained her to to know that it's okay and she gets a reward mm. yeah exactly yeah so that's basically all the videos i got for you <laughs> yeah i am um, oh that's really good i am um, I think particularly the farmers that I know in New Zealand, we always, I think we know that if you keep your routines the same, cows love routine. Mm -hmm. So if you do everything at the same time, if you go to the, the paddock to pick the cows up and you're 30 minutes late, they'll all be waiting at the gate for you. Yeah. Um, if you basically um, keep them fed and make it as pleasant as possible for them, life goes easy. Um but I think what and but what you're sort of saying there is making me think a lot is is how do we actually build that more into our system? So we're actually using rewards, yeah, far uh, to a far greater extent. And also that's just that teach teaching those calves right from the start. I think that's mm -hmm. um, really interesting as well. No, mm -hmm. I think that's I think that would be amazing. Like from my perspective, and again, like I think. Mm. we have the technology like it's all there we just have to learn how to how to make use of it in the right way mm -hmm. have you um uh, i suppose the downside with 
well, not the downside, but the, there's certain procedures where you'd need to have to restrain a cow. Maybe if you're going to do something on her hoof or something like that, um, may possibly artificially insemination, uh, insemination would need to be restrained. Um, but I, I do I, lo I like that principle of building the setup so that the cow is in that different state of mind of actually wanting to go in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, yeah. like I think one thing that we don't know, I can give you a little bit of anecdotal, anecdotal mm -hmm. um, stories about from other animals, from other trainers who train zoo animals and stuff. So, um, but generally speaking, what we don't really know is if we trained, let's say that we used the trained heifers that you saw, and what happened? What would happen if we actually close the headlock, give her the injection, and then so that's aversive. But she has had a lot of really positive experiences with this place because she has had so much grain there. Mm. How would that affect, right? So we would still get the job done, but we also made sure that she's in the best best possible state of mind. So we don't know that there's just not research on that. But what I can tell yeah. you from other trainers is they generally say one bad experience to 100 good experiences. And they're just going, you know, they don't have data on that. They just like, that's their experience. Mm -hmm. So, but because of course, like there's always going to be procedures where we have to do the things. If it's a sick animal that doesn't eat, what do you do then? Right? Like um, mm -hmm. you'll still have to treat the animal. Um, mm. for a welfare reason so mm. so I think we'll yeah. always get to this point but thinking yeah. about how we can yeah. at least make it better um, yeah. I think it's already good mm. Mm. yeah and I, and I think that idea let's say you, you've trained the animal it comes through it gets fed it wants to go into the the headlock or wants to put its head in it's not worried about it uh, it's had a, a good stable state of mind i suppose and then you do actually lock her head in there to do her foot or something i'm just wondering if that's actually worse than getting the injection i mean would she really mind that much um and like, like you said that's hmm. we don't know so what i can tell you i guess too i totally hmm. agree so there is something that we can violate expectations and that can be actually harmful if i understood you right so what can happen of course we don't know is it going to be better for her or is it going to be worse for her because she had like all these positive expectations and then all of a sudden we're doing something mean to her right yeah um so what i can tell you without the training so one of our three groups that we compared um within the study mm -hmm. one of the groups we had brought up to this training area and restrained every single time we brought a training area training heifer up so they had the same experience they were just they didn't in terms of time spent in the training area, they just had a different experience in terms of they didn't have any contact with us really, and they didn't get any food. And for these heifers, they actually reacted the most to the injection in that moment. And we mm -hmm. think this happened because they had the experience and the expectation that they would get in there. We close the headlock, we leave them standing there and nothing bad happens, but nothing good happens either. And then they just go back home to their pen. And then all of a sudden we came and just gave them an injection and touched them and did all these things to them that they, so this really stood out so much to them and was mm -hmm. such a violation of their expectation that actually the injection itself possibly was more aversive to them. That being said, they were okay. You know, they, they didn't show any other behaviors in the days later that would suggest that they were traumatized or anything for longer, but they did show more reactions in that moment. Yeah, yeah. And that's interesting. I mean, I, I suppose, like you say, we, we take cows and we sometimes have to do things to them that they don't want to do. For instance, sore feet is the one that I I look at the most and, and maybe mastitis. And, you know, you look at that cow a week, two weeks later, and is she actually traumatized i don't i don't know but um it, yeah it's, i think you know it's probably hard to say the word the to choose the right words or what it exactly it is but 
I do think, you know, like in the end, what we can do is try to, within our possibilities, to make especially routine procedures as mm. positive mm. as possible, right? We do know that animals have to be vaccinated. Of course, it's not traumatizing per se, but if we have possibilities to make it better for them, why, sh why shouldn't we try, right? Absolutely. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and I, that's the thing. I think if we're going to do animal agriculture, I think it needs to be um, impeccable. We need to do it as best way we can. And I think this um, putting an emphasis on the, I suppose, the emotional well-being of the of the cow mm -hmm. and the calf and, and everyone through there actually has benefits for the farmer as well. At, and a, an interesting thing I was just thinking of is sometimes you try and do half a system. Maybe you try and um, implement some of these techniques within the existing uh, infrastructure you've got, it doesn't mm -hmm. really work. You know, let's say fenceless, milk, uh, fenceless um, uh, systems. Maybe you can't fully use it if you're still trying to work within existing paradigms. So sometimes I think to get this to work properly, you actually have to bite the bullet and actually completely change the whole system and work from basically from a blank sheet of paper and build a system from the ground up. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's a good thought. I it's, I really like that. It's hard to say, and, and it's kind of scary too, right? Because then you don't know <laughs> if it's, if it's going to work. But um, Well, no, you don't. And the reason I say that is with the cow and calf thing. It's just so hard to implement the cow and calf mm -hmm. scenario into a typical New Zealand dairy farm because of the way the milking parlors are set up and the way the cows mm -hmm. walk from the pasture to the cow sheds and, and those sorts of things. So, um, mm, yeah, anyway. interesting. Yeah. I love it. It's really, um, I, yeah, I agree. Like, I mean, there would be, probably would have to be made some changes for sure. I just, you know, like it reminds me of a situation we had at the farm where, uh, we wanted to, like the management decided to make a change and replace lying stalls um, that had a mat and a little bit of sand on top. Mm -hmm. They had to rip the mats out and just make a deep bedded sand stalls, which is much better for the cows. And usually the cows will lie down more, more, um, more often and for longer. But mm -hmm. so what happened, there was just one pen or two pens that needed to still be modified. And so what happened was all the cows were standing all of a sudden after the mats were ripped out. And, ah. and of course that took a little while to, to notice. And then what happened was because of the, like the stall dimensions were just so wrong without the mats that the, they, they were too small for, ah. for the cows. So fortunately this was a super easy fix and all was good but you know it just reminded me of how you know it's understandable that that one can be reluctant to implement a change because there can be unforeseeable negative impacts right like that yeah means, yeah so uh, yeah uh, it is it's so true um yeah, and it's just and it's hard to um, to mix systems together. And, and what what happens if you're a farmer and you try something new, and of course it doesn't really work? You'll just say, "Oh, that doesn't work. I'm not going to do it again." Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and it's, it's all sorts of things that you don't realize are going to unforeseen circumstances that uh, you don't see, like you like you mentioned there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but. Um, I think there's a real willingness. I'm, I'm noticing a real willingness among farmers to, you know, to change and try and make things things better. Um, and I, I think, as you said earlier in the podcast, most farmers um, treat their cows really, really well. And um, and I think if you can show the importance of your research and the work you guys do at the university, there is, um, you know, farmers need to see a bit of evidence and a bit of proof before they all try and do stuff. And um, they can't, won't just listen to people who anecdotally have some uh, some thoughts on something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, anyway, I think um, we'll let you go. And thank you very much for your time. Um, and I think we will chat again. Um, 
I'd love to to continue to follow your research and uh, and actually talk to your colleagues as well. Absolutely, I'll get you in touch. And um, <laughs> it was fun. Thanks for inviting me again. And um, yeah, that yeah. was great. Thanks so much. Excellent. No, and I uh, would love to. Uh, I've got plenty of questions I'd like to ask you, happy cow related, in the future. So uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, and uh, we'll keep in touch. Sounds right. great. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone for joining us, and uh, we'll see you maybe next week or the week after. <laughs>